We have been reading through the book of Acts, and so I want, we're going to jump right in because we're getting through two whole chapters of the book of Acts today. So I want to encourage you to go ahead and grab your Bibles. If you need a Bible, we got them that we give away in the lobby on the shelf out there by the door. Uh, we'll be in the book of Acts, which is the fifth book of the New Testament of the Bible. You've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are gospel stories, which means it's biographies of the life of Jesus. The fifth book is Acts, and it's the history of the early church and like how it got going and, and, and specifically how the Holy Spirit moved and, and did a lot of things. And we have seen a lot, man. We've seen... Jesus ascend into heaven. Like, what a scene. We've seen angels talking to people. We've heard Jesus promise to come back and, and, and collect his faithful followers. We've seen uh, his, the Holy Spirit, God's presence in spirit form, show up and accompany these early apostles in the early church in some amazing ways. Last week, we saw people speaking in languages they'd never studied and learned, and they were you know, to, to preach and teach. And that day, 3,000 people got baptized on the very first day of the church. And that's all in just the first two chapters of the book of Acts. It is a fast-moving, full action adventure story of the early church. And so it's a dynamic history of the beginning of the church and how it begins to spread around the world. Now, there are 26 chapters in the book of Acts. It's not a super long book anyway, but as far as Bible books go, it's, it's a little bit longer. Our goal is to handle it in just eight weeks, okay? And to do that, we're going to start picking up the pace a little bit. We spent two weeks in the first two chapters, but if you're doing the math, you're like, all right, it's 24 left to go. How are we going to get through this thing? Well, as we do it, what we're doing is we're trying to break them up into eight kind of memorable chunks. And with each chunk or section, we're using one single word to define that section. For example, does anybody remember what the word from week one was? Give it to me. Wait. So wait. And we had the story of the apostles being sent back to Jerusalem to wait and we talked about the importance of waiting and the most important things in our life happen with what we do in the time between big events. Like, what are you doing while you sit here? How are you letting God grow you and use you and prepare you? So it was, wait, what was, what was the second week? Do you remember it? Helper. Yeah, you're on it. Helper. Helper. Helper is code word for the gift they were waiting for, which is who? The Holy Spirit. Yeah, so we talked about God's Holy Spirit and him coming into our life and being our helper. And he specifically, in Acts chapter 2, does the incredible thing of showing up and helping these people communicate, break down barriers, speak in languages they didn't already know, and, and ultimately be able to spread the word of Jesus to regions they couldn't even travel to because the visitors in town that day were able to take it for them. Today, I'm going to go ahead and give it to you. I got all these signs on the floor. I'm going to kick them over. Got to be careful. Today's word is about what happens when God's followers really face conflict. When we go up against opposition and things that might not be all for what we're all for, and how do we like navigate that? The word is boldness. And we're going to be going through Acts chapter 2 and I'm sorry, Acts chapter 3 and 4 today, and we're just going to jump right in Acts chapter 3 verse 1. One day, while Peter and John were going to the temple at the time of prayer, at three in the afternoon, there was a man who was lame from birth, and he was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going to the temple courts. And when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Sounds like a good Bible story. People are walking to the temple. Someone's there and needs some help. What's going to go down? Uh, Peter and John meet this guy. And he's been crippled from birth. And this is the thing. Like, there's all these people in Scripture who have, like, disabilities, ailments, and they're lame and crippled in different ways. And they're just, like, named by their, their ailments. The crippled guys, the blind guy. And, like, I, I don't know. They did that, and it's fine. But I like to give these, these people names because I like someone to remember my name. We don't know this guy's name, but let's give this guy a name. And, and, and I think a cool name for him would be... Gary. Can we call him Gary? This is Gary, the guy at the gate, okay? The triple G. So he's Gary, and he's the guy at the gate. He's been disabled, and he's in the first century. And here's the thing. In first century land, if you are disabled, it's difficult for you to make a living. It's difficult for you to do much. Fortunately, he has someone that can take him over to the gate of the temple, and he's a panhandler. And that's how he's making his life and making his living. And like he does with many people, he's calling out to them as they go into temple for worship. He gets Peter's attention. So we got Gary calling out to Peter. Have you ever had a friend who just has like a favorite subject that no matter what you're talking about, they can somehow end up talking about CrossFit. Like it doesn't matter like, oh my goodness, like no, I don't want to go join your cult and throw tires around. Like that's not what I want to do. Or fantasy football. Maybe I'm hitting closer to home for those who don't want to flip a tire but do like to pretend like we're athletes, right? Fantasy football. It's like I, 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 I was saying the weather is nice. Yeah, it's nice for the draft. I'm doing a mock draft this afternoon. 
It's April. Yeah, you can never be too prepared, right? So, like, you get to that person, right? And they always seem to be able to gear the conversation back to that, their, their pet topic that they're always talking about. Well, Peter and John have a pet topic. And you're going to see it over and over again. We saw it in chapter 2. Their pet topic is this. Jesus. And specifically, he rose from the dead. Have you heard? Jesus. And he rose from the dead, and he's changing the world, and he's changing our lives. And so check out what they say to this guy, Gary, at the gate. As he's asking them for money, they turn the whole conversation on his ear, and they switch it to their favorite topic. So we're going to get to verse 6. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. And Gary's probably thinking, oh, sweet. (laughs) What do you have? Like... In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. Like picture the the computer graphics necessary to make this happen on a movie. If you saw Steve Rogers and Captain America go from the scrawny little kid to the big muscular soldier like... But this dude's ankles and his legs and his ability to stand, like don't... Pass that over. Grabs him by his hands, lift him up, and, 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 and you're Gary, right? Picture this. What in the world? Holy cow. He jumped to his feet, and he began to walk. Like, so I have been, um, I've been approached by people asking for money plenty of times. You know, maybe you have too, and you're going into the store, and they ask you for money. I have a general policy, and it is that I try not to give cash money to people who just ask me. I don't know you. That's basically it. I don't know you. I don't know what your actual needs are, but I'm not just going to blow you off. So, so I many times have been like, uh, you want, can I, I'll give you a ride. We can go, you need to go somewhere. You want to go get some food? Can I help you? Can I give you something that I do have? So I've tried that. Uh, but never once have I looked out my car window and been like, ah, silver and gold I do not have. <laughs> but in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, give me your hand. <laughs> Walk, right? But I mean, like how, how brave, how courageous, how bold for him to have done that. To trust that God's Holy Spirit, like imagine how flat this would have fallen if he hadn't been healed. Get up and walk. Come on, man. (laughs) You know, like that's not cool, Peter. Like why would you do that? But the faith he had to reach down and grab his hand and say, I trust that God's Spirit's going to heal you because I need to make a scene right now for my favorite subject. We look at verse uh, 8 now. So he jumped to his feet. He began to walk. And then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. Maybe you remember that old Sunday school song. You'll be singing it the rest of your life. If you don't know it, it's on YouTube. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. They were filled with wonder, with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Uh, side note, that temple gate called Beautiful, there were a couple of ways into the temple area, and they had like nicknames, and this was the gate that they called Beautiful. So they were astonished. The crowds around saw it happen. They see this guy, Gary, and they're like, is that Gary? Like, what's going on? They were blown away, and so they begin to gather around Peter and John. Acts chapter 3, verse 12 now. When Peter saw this, he saw the crowd gathering around. He said, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? It wasn't me. The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, time out, we're in the temple, okay? And do you know how Jews identified their God? They wanted to make sure it was very clear that they were all worshiping the same guy. And they would say, This is the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers. He's just saying, I want you to know the same God that you are here to worship right now has glorified his servant, Jesus. And just like in chapter 2 last week, Peter immediately takes the, the attention off of himself and puts it on his favorite subject, Jesus. It wasn't me. It wasn't by my power, my strength, or my cleverness. It was because your God has glorified Jesus. Verse 16. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him. As you can all see. I think it's very cool here that they point out that the people in the temple recognized Gary. They they. They recognized him as the guy who was always sitting there by the temple. This isn't like 
uh, snake oil like trickery? This isn't someone faking it. Like, no, we, we know that guy. Like, I've, I've actually given that guy some money before. I stopped and gave him a sandwich one time. Or I walked by and kind of ignored him every day. But whatever the case, they recognized him. And then also, like in chapter 2, Peter's going to give these listeners an offer to join the movement. There's this huge movement happening. You, know, you might remember, at the end of last week's sermon that Peter gave, 3,000 people gave their life to Jesus. 3,000 people were baptized. This little ragtag group of people who a couple of weeks ago were huddling scared in their house because Jesus had been executed are now finding the bravery, the courage, the boldness to speak out. The Holy Spirit shows up, gives them the ability to do things that they wouldn't be able to do on their own. And 3,000 people in that first day choose to follow Jesus. And this moment was pretty awesome. Gary's healed. People are praising God because of it. Everyone's on fire. I mean, who wouldn't love this? This is amazing. But it turns out, not everyone's happy. We're crossing to chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 1. The priests and the captains of the temple guard and the Sadducees came to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. These are leaders of the temple area, specifically the Sadducees, kind of, they, they were kind of, let's call it a political party, and they were kind of in charge of the temple. The priest was a title that many of them held. Some of them probably were Sadducean in the way that they thought, and I won't even get into all the things that they thought, but they, they send their guards out to Peter and John, verse 2, they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Remember that. So they seized Peter and John. Because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. It was the end of business, so you got to wait till tomorrow. But many who heard the message believed. And so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. First of all, wow. <laughs> okay, so last count, we're at 3,000. Okay, and so like 3,000, and you have a big boom in attendance, and people are excited about it. Like, how big do you think this movement is getting? And I'm thinking like, well, 3,250 would be pretty impressive. And 3,300 would be pretty impressive. But another 2,000 people have already added to the ranks of Christians, followers of Jesus. So, wow, praise God for that. That's amazing. But wait, that wasn't the headline in that last little section that we read. What? Peter and John get arrested and thrown into jail overnight until they can deal with them in the morning. Who would have a problem with somebody healing a lame guy? Who would, who would have a problem with that? What's wrong with you? This guy, Gary, he's been begging by the temple gate for his whole life, and finally, he's so excited. Can you see the joy in his face? You see the places where his this, this tears have run down his dirty cheeks because he was so excited. You, like, you see this moment? And there are some people seeing this happen and going, mm -mm, we can't allow this. And, go and arrest Peter and John. Why is that? Why is that? Um, I think there's two things to consider. F first of all is this. There was a, uh, a belief among the Sadducees and many in the area that like, after you die, there's nothing else. There's nothing else. To talk about there being something else, an afterlife or something like that, would be what they called the resurrection. And they weren't down with that. They didn't teach that. And there's a lot of different nuance to the teaching on the resurrection. But they, they, didn't, they didn't like that teaching. That's one reason why they didn't like Jesus' teaching. That's one reason why they haven't liked what the apostles are teaching. Because they keep on talking about this resurrection of the dead. And now they're talking about this guy, Jesus, who they're saying literally rose from the dead. He was physically dead. And then he physically came back to life and didn't die again. And then went to be with the Father. The, the Sadducees are not down with this because they just think this is completely false doctrine. And it's leading people astray. And how dare you, right? And so that's one half of the story. The other half of the story is this. There was this superstition that someone like Gary was crippled for a reason. The superstition was probably God is punishing him because probably his parents or his grandparents had done something really sinful and as a, as a punishment for their sin, they, they allowed their child or their grandchild to be lame. How dare you come in and undo God's punishment? If I came home after like a day out and I'm working or wherever I am, and, and I came home and I found that my kids, my son and my daughter, were being punished by their mom. I don't know what they did. I don't know. I just got here. 
parents, you ever been there? I just got here. Like, what's going on? I have no idea what's just happening right now. But I just got here. The kids are upset because they've been grounded or punished or taken stuff away. I don't know. Something's going on. And I walk in the house, and I imagine one thing. I walk in, and I'm like, what's going on here? Oh, you're grounded? No, you're not. She doesn't know what she's talking about. You're not grounded. Go play. Go. Okay, that's a, that's a fail, by the way. So if you've ever done that, and you were wondering why your spouse was so mad at you, that was stupid, okay? You never do that. Like, there's a reason that mom punished them. Like, I need to talk to her. I need to figure out. Like, is it, oh, ooh, I, I probably would have been more severe. Like, right? You don't come in undoing God's punishment. I want to clarify, this isn't true. God doesn't say that if you're a sinner, your grandkids will have disabilities. Like, that's not exactly what any of that means, but it was a superstition. So there's this, there's this cultural bias or, you know, prejudice against people who are disabled, and uh, they probably deserve it, which is somehow, somehow how they justified how they treated them. And so for whatever reason, whether it was undoing of God's punishment or the talk about the resurrection, which is explicitly stated here, they were definitely upset about that. They were like, we got to get to the bottom of this Peter and John stuff, and meanwhile, let's lock them up. So even while the crowd is celebrating... Even while Gary is jumping and leaping and praising God, you got a group of people who aren't happy about it. And so the temple guards put him under arrest. Wow, okay, things escalated quickly. So let's see how it plays out. Verse 5, this is Acts chapter 4, verse 5. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there. So was Caiaphas and John and Alexander and the others of the high priest's family. These names might not mean a lot to you. You might have noticed one or two of them. You don't have to know all the history. In fact, I think with some of them, we're kind of guessing on who they are. But this is what you need to know. Uh, These were the big wigs of the leading council in the temple. This was like the Supreme Court gathering of people that can make judgments on things. And and Annas and Caiaphas specifically, Annas was the high priest. And so there's all this priestly division among the people of Israel, and it's a specific family group and some of them rise up to actually be priests who serve in the temple but only one was the high priest and he was in charge of all the actions of the temple and oversaw all the other things annas was currently serving as the high priest and his dad his name was caiaphas incidentally annas and caiaphas they presided over jesus's trial for his execution so you can imagine that when peter and john are in jail and they found out they've got to face annas and caiaphas and their crowd that's an intimidating group of people to face Just recently, that group of people has sentenced their leader, Jesus, to execution, okay? So you're sitting in prison, and you're knowing that this is ahead of you. They bring him in, verse 7. They had Peter and John brought before them, and they began to question them. By what power or what name do you do this? That's a fair question. By what power and by what man? Where do you get off? Coming in here and talking the way that you talk and doing the things that you're doing. I think if this were a movie, this would be the moment where like the screen goes a little bit fuzzy and there's some like ethereal music playing and maybe it goes a little bit sapia tone and you start to have a flashback. There was a time where Jesus was teaching Peter and John and the other disciples and he said something that I believe prepared them for this moment. This is in Luke chapter 12 verse 11 if you want to jot it down. But he said, when you were brought before the synagogues, The rulers or the authorities do not worry about how you would defend yourselves or what you will say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. Do you remember the Holy Spirit? We've talked about him a lot lately. And last week, he was the main topic of conversation. This is God's presence in our life, being our guide, our advocate, our teacher, our helper. This, by the way, is a fantastic lesson for anyone who's in Christ. There are times in which you just don't know what to do and what to say. And the best thing you can do is lean in through prayer and talk to the Father and say, Lord, let your spirit guide me right now. And I I just, I feel certain. Peter and John and that dusty old cell were like, Holy Spirit, it's time for you to show up. (laughs) Because there's a good chance we're not going to make it through this day. We are probably going to be executed just like Jesus was because this right here, this is serious. We have been drawn in, essentially charged for the same things that Jesus was charged for. So they're standing, and by what power and what authority do you do these things? Verse 8. It says Peter speaks up, but it clarifies. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he said, rulers... And elders 
of the people? If we are being called here today on account of an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame, and we're being asked how he was healed, well, know this. You and all the other people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raises from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. You want to know who did this? You want to know by whose power and whose authority? (laughs) Have you heard about my favorite subject? Jesus, by the power and by the name of Jesus. And as if these guys who just recently presided over his trial, and I can't, I can't understate how much of a ruckus Jesus just recently caused in Jerusalem. Like, it was a pretty big deal. Everybody was talking about it, okay? It was a big deal. It would have been trending on Twitter or X or whatever it's called now. Like, this is a big deal. And so as if Annas and Caiaphas, who were right there looking at Jesus, forgot, he was like, you know, Jesus, the one whom you crucified, but whom God raised back to life. You remember that guy? And then in verse 11, he kind of adds this little singer. And, and, and I want to explain it, but like just take it in. He says, Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. This is a, a powerful argument that he's making here he raises a quote from psalm chapter 118 verse 22 and now this doesn't hit you very hard i know it's not gonna hit us very hard we don't study the book of psalms we don't sit around our kitchen tables with our family singing the psalms we don't get up in the morning and go to school when we're little kids and we're memorizing and we're singing in the psalms but these guys the leaders in the temple they knew the psalms they specifically know what we call psalm 118 and they specifically would have understood this psalm the stone the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was, a, this was considered a, a, a prophecy or a statement or a description of the coming Messiah. That one day there was going to be someone to rise to the ranks and the people were just going to reject him. And Peter quotes that. They know what it's about. And he says, you are the ones who rejected him. In effect saying, listen, you guys who think you know everything and you're in charge of all the religious stuff, you missed the main thing. You're the ones who missed him. And not only that, you put him to death, but don't worry about that. Because God rose him back to life. You want to know who gave us the authority and from where we got the power to let this guy walk? It was that guy. That guy that you guys have been singing about your whole life. And then to add one little zinger to it, he says this thing, which is so inflammatory. He says, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind where we must be saved. That last little punctuation... Jesus is the only way to salvation. That, that little piece, that would be nothing short of blasphemy. Blasphemy, a crime punishable by death in their system. This is to claim the authority or the position of God in any way. To say that anybody was the path to salvation, and this is specifically say he's the only path to salvation, is to spit on and stomp on the whole code of Moses, the Old Testament law, the people that these people are living by. Jesus is the way. He's the path to salvation. And I wonder if Peter in that moment said it and then he just kind of went. Because he was probably prepared to get tackled and dragged out of the room and stoned in the street. How dare you speak to the high priest like this? But that's not what happened. (laughs) It takes guts. It takes faith. It takes boldness. And look how it plays out. Verse 13. When that council saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that these are unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. So they're kind of standing there with their jaws dropped like, that's not what I expected him to say. (laughs) I I, I don't know what I expected him to say. I, I I think there was some conversation that maybe they were possessed by evil spirits that comes up in some other stories maybe you're playing for the other team and we don't know by whose power do you do these things that's right that's right you work for the bad guy okay now we have justification to be mad but like he's quoting our scripture at us he's pointing to this guy jesus who everybody's saying rose from the dead and oh my goodness what do we do now and so this next sentence is my favorite in the story verse 14 but since they could see the man who had been healed standing there There was nothing they could say. The evidence is standing right before him. 
we're in our, our venture basics class we're going through, and we're in week three today. Um, we're talking about who is God, who is Jesus, is the Bible reliable? And something we talked about last week is the reliability of who Jesus was. And one of the biggest cases for Jesus being who he said he was is that no one denied the miracles of Jesus and his apostles. No one denied that, even these people. These people could be like, nah, nah, that's not, there's, I don't, it, it wasn't that. It might have been something else, but it wasn't that. This is trickery, right? But they don't deny it. It says, since they could clearly see Gary <laughs> standing there, hey, can I go now? I want to run some laps around the temple. There was nothing they could say. Verse 15. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin, and they conferred together. You remember the old cartoons where all the cartoon characters get together, put their head like, this? Remember that? Like, I grew up on Bugs Bunny. So I'm imagining that's kind of what the Sanhedrin's doing. Probably not. They're probably yelling and being very upset because there's a lot of emotion in this room. And they say to each other, what are we to do with these men? Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they performed a notable sign, and we cannot deny it. There he is. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer in this name. They feel stuck. They don't know what to do with the apostles. They don't approve of what's happened, but they don't see any way out of this. And so they're just going to intimidate the disciples, slap them on the hand. And they come with a, a, like a warning. At this point, Peter and John are about to get off the hook completely with whatever these guys say. They're about to get off completely, and they could be like, okay, yeah, whatever you say. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. But that's not what happens. I want you to notice what happens after Peter and John received the verdict. This is verse 18. Then they called them in again, and they commanded them, do not speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Like, that's their verdict. We're going to let you go, but shh, stop it. <laughs> stop that. Stop talking about Jesus. But Peter replied, hmm, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judge. Which I catch a little irony in these because they are the judge. Like, that's their whole point. It's like, you be the judge. I, you don't tell me to be the judge. I'll be the judge when I want to be the judge. You be the judges. As for us, we can't help speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what happened. Listen, if you're the priest of the temple, what's your main goal for the people that come to the temple? To praise God. Like, well, this guy, this guy's making people praise God. <laughs> oh, my goodness, I'm stuck. I, I love what John says here, by the way. He says, we're speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. And if you look at the Gospel of John, uh, actually, this is it's a little bit in the Gospel of John, in First John, the letter. This is how he writes about it. He's like, we're talking about what we have seen and what we have heard. This is like his phrase. He's like, this is my testimony. This is not me making stuff up. So right here, John, Wow like looks down the barrel of the gun that's about to shut him down. He says, sorry, like you do to me what you want. But I, I can't not do this. I know what I saw. I know what I've heard. I got to stand on this platform. I got to do what God calls me to do. And they left. And we pick up their story next week. Boldness. What does it mean to be Bold. I think it would be really easy for us to look at this story, Peter and John, and be like, well, of course they were brave, bold. I mean, they saw Jesus raised from the dead. Like, they saw him ascend into heaven. Like, of course they would be bold. And, and maybe they do have a little bit more to stand on. They've seen some more things. They've got more reason to believe. But here's the thing. They're human. They're human. Like, I wish I could have been a fly on the wall the night before. They got arrested. They got thrown in this jail. And then they're just waiting. Like, what was their conversation like that night? Knowing, man, you think we're going to see Annas and Caiaphas? Those guys are hard, man. They're so mean. They're so well-respected. Like, I get nervous. I don't know. I don't know. P Peter doesn't seem to get nervous about much, so maybe he wasn't too nervous. Did they write letters to their families? We did the right thing. Keep following Jesus. We love you. Like, I believe that these guys had every reason to believe they would not have made it out of this scenario. Whether it would be locked up for a lot longer or maybe had the same fate as their Savior. What was their posture like? Did they sleep? Like, put yourself in their shoes for just a moment. They knew what they were up against. It hadn't that, been that long ago since Jesus himself had faced a similar trial, and he didn't get fair treatment at all. In fact, the way that they tried Jesus was actually kind of illegal <laughs> to, their current, to their laws. They just rushed through it, and they pushed him along. 
But one thing that separates leaders from followers is boldness. The people that become world changers, the people that make a difference in your life, your neighborhood, your schools, your places of work, they're the people who are bold, the people who are ready to stand up and do things. And so there's this definition for boldness that I heard a long time ago. I've been using it for years. And I want to share it with you. What is boldness? Boldness is a behavior. It's born out of a belief, and it comes with a known risk. It's a behavior. It's something that you do, but why are you doing it? I do it because I believe something. But it's not just like, you know, I, I put, you know, I've, I've heard this, uh, this thing. Have you ever put a, a olive oil on your ice cream? I haven't tried it yet. I, that's a thing? I don't know. I heard a commercial where someone's like, you should try this. That's, that's a behavior born out of a belief that it tastes good, but like, it comes with a known risk. I admit, that seems risky. <laughs> but boldness is more like the story of Rosa Parks. You know the story of this lady? This is a lady during the civil rights movement in the 60s, and there's this, there's, this, there's this hierarchy, and there's this pecking order, and you know it's a racial thing. And she's on this bus, and she's sitting on this seat. And there's people that get on the bus who think that that should be their seat. They're like, get up. And she's like, no, nah. no, nah, I should be able to sit here. I had a long day. And she didn't get up, and, and she knew the risk. In fact, her brothers and sisters and friends around had, had experienced the risk of being punished, of being thrown into jail, of being attacked. She knew the risk, but there was part of a movement that was happening at that time. Like, we're going to step up. We're going to do these things because we need to make a statement. It's boldness. It's behavior born out of a belief, but it comes with a known risk. You're not being bold just because you do something loud. (laughs) You're being bold because you do something that you know this could be a risk to your own well-being. Rosa Parks goes to jail. The civil rights movement moves on, and she's a one of the first of many, many, many who have to take these bold stances. And like, if you look through world history, you see the world changes and the people who shake things up are the will to say, like, I'm not concerned about the risk. I'm concerned about the principle. I'm concerned about the truth. I'm concerned about what needs to be done. And when it comes, being, when it comes to being bold about God, I think we can learn a lot from Peter and John in this scenario. It says, when they saw the courage of Peter and John, they realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. And they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. What is boldness? What does it take for us to be bold? I've got three observations and then a challenge, and then we're done. So uh, every week we're having in this series like a little note sheet that's in your seats, and and each one has the, the word on the top for the day. So there's a sheet around you that says boldness. Some of you are collecting all eight, I hope. You're going to have them in your sealed containers. Show your grandkids that you made it through the whole sermon series. Um, but if you want to grab that note, this would be some good things maybe to jot down and think about. These are my observations. First one is this. God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Peter and John were just ordinary people fishermen from Galilee. I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of people just like them had lived and died. They were nobodies in the world scheme. They were uneducated, as was pointed out by the Sanhedrin. But God uses them to do some incredible things. The movement of the church that continues to this day is standing on the shoulders of very, very ordinary people. And sometimes we're like, man, you know what? I think I could stand up and do more things if I was more educated, if I had this or if I had that. God doesn't need you to have the whole Bible memorized or even read. You don't even maybe need know all the books of the Bible. You don't need a degree in theology. You just need to be willing to put yourself in the faithfulness of God. Be super ordinary. In fact, I think God prefers you just like you are. He wants you just the way you are. Now, he's going to grow you, and he's going to develop you, and he's going to give you opportunities. We sometimes have this idea, like, if I could know more and I could experience more, then I could make a difference. No, man. God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Second observation, your boldness will amaze people. Blow them away. It says the people were astonished. (laughs) When you see people doing incredible, amazing things, in boldness. You remember that. You remember the kid who spoke up and did a thing that you're like, I wish I could have done that. Or you remember the time when you stood up and did something that was uncomfortable or outside of your comfort zone because of a belief that you had, knowing that there was a risk. And finally, this is the most important. Boldness comes from spending time with Jesus. I need to clarify this because boldness is not exclusively for Christians. There's a lot of bold people and you don't have to be a Christian to be bold. People take risks all the time for things that are lies or inconsequential, okay? Um, But this type of boldness, this world-changing, culture-changing, 
life-changing boldness that stands up for the truth of God, this comes from spending time with Jesus. And you might find that you, you don't feel bold very often. Can I challenge you to get into God's word? Reading the first four books of the New Testament is a good start. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John hear the stories of Jesus. Spending time with Jesus by spending time with Jesus' followers is a huge way to do it. Like, what do you think Jesus would say about this? What do you think he would do about this? These guys spent three and a half years walking with Jesus. And, and if you follow them from the beginning to the end, you really find that, like, at the beginning, they were just, like, lost. <laughs> they were constantly having to be corrected by Jesus. They were constantly having to be told to get back on course, back on course, back on course. But by the end, as Jesus leads them, they realize, oh, we're the ones who have to lead the charge now. And where did they draw from? The time they had spent with Jesus. That's a lifelong journey, okay? So however much time you've had with Jesus so far, that's enough for now. But just keep leaning in. Keep taking one more step. That's what faith is all about. Those, those are my observations. And so I want to leave us with a challenge. My challenge is this. This week, choose a way each day to step outside your comfort zone with your faith. And trust the Holy Spirit to guide you. It was hard to come up with a challenge for this story. Because, like, how do you, you want to try to go get thrown into jail? That's probably pretty easy. Um, <laughs> maybe don't do that. But what does it look like you to step outside of your comfort zone? Because I think all of us know where I'm comfortable in my faith. And I think we intuitively might know what step I might want to take to get out of it. And I'm going to speak to a couple groups very quickly. It might be for you that you're like, I don't really know what my faith is. Like, I'm just here. I'm just coming to church, and I'm just taking steps and figuring out. You know one way to grow in your faith is to take a step of faith. To grow in your faith just by, like, trying another day. <laughs> And again, I don't want to be too like specific about it because it's different for each one of us, but it might be that like I'm just going to try praying every day. Like it feels kind of dumb to pray maybe for you, but you're like I'm going to try it. I'm going to try trusting a promise that God made. I'm going to try reading scripture more often. And that that might be just a very entry level step for you. You might be maybe somewhere in the middle I could call it where you're like, "Okay, I think I'm ready to take a full on step with Jesus. I want to commit my life to him. I want to become a Jesus follower. I want to get baptized like they've been talking about for weeks here at church. I want to I want to do that." Like, I don't know where it's going to go, but I'll step out of my, side of my comfort zone and say, I'm in. I'm, com- I'm all in. Or maybe you want to take even a step further. Like, if you've been following Jesus for a while, man, my guess is you've gotten to a pretty comfortable rut. You know how I th- am assuming that? Because we are American Christians, and it's not very hard to be Christians. No one's kicking down your door, threatening your life. No one's telling you that you can't do this and that. And yeah, I know, some places make it difficult. But... No, nah, man, we don't experience that much persecution here. It's really comfortable if you kind of stay quiet. And just kind of sit on the back row and just kind of hang out. Like, you can be a Christian and be pretty comfortable. But when God sparks a movement, he infuses it with his power, his authority, his Holy Spirit. What does it look like for you to take a step outside of that comfort level? Is there someone in your life you can invite along the journey with you? Is there a thing happening at work that you could speak up to and say, we need to have integrity here. We need to do things the way Jesus would do it here. Is there things happening in your family where you say, you know what, guys, we don't like really follow Jesus in our home. The, the trash we watch on TV, the way we talk to each other is not the way Jesus would have us be. And that's not comfortable. But those steps of faith is, is boldness. There's risk involved. The risk of rejection, yes. The risk of not knowing what to say, yes. But Jesus said, trust me, the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say when you need them. I can speak from firsthand experience to say that that's happened to me so many times. True, there have been times I didn't know what to say. And I think sometimes that's because God's like, shut your mouth. You don't need to say anything right now. <laughs> and when you need to, I'll let you know what to say. And it comes, it bubbles out. Boldness. As we follow Jesus, it takes a lot of things. Today, our challenge is to be bold. Dig into what that means for you. When God sparks a movement, he changes the world. And he can start with ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Let's pray.